Good morning. I'm Pastor Greg Scalzo. And I'm Patty Scalzo. And we welcome you to this Sunday morning live stream on the Shia Jeshub Christian Tabernacle channel. Patty, today we have a very special program for our viewers. Uh, that's right. Today's sermon is an important one on baptism. And we are going to listen to the sermon that you gave back in June of 2019 at the baptism of our little grandson, James Declan Orris. Oh. And that was well before the, uh, the COVID crisis began right. in 2020. So at that point, our services were still at our regular meeting place, which is the upper room of the Memorial Hall, the Madison Memorial Hall. Right. And we had the church and family and friends gathered together for that special event. And it was a powerful message. And we have the audio from it. Since, as always, we recorded the sermon so that we would be able, if it would be available if we wanted to air it on the radio. That's right. And this was before we started the, uh, the YouTube live stream. Uh, but we also had PowerPoints that I put up on the screen at that service for the church to view as I taught about baptism. Uh, that was in, back in 2019. So we've taken those PowerPoints and we've incorporated them with the audio uh, into the video you're about to watch. Yes, and in this teaching, you provide the solid scriptural basis for a proper understanding of what Christian baptism is and is not. And you explain our church's unique position when it comes to infant baptism. That's right, it is unique. Yes. Many, many born-again churches do not baptize infants and small children because the children cannot consciously make a knowledgeable decision for Christ. And many of the older mainline churches, when they baptize infants, it's as though the baptism ritual saves them. Right. And then they do the baptism uh, many times, uh, they're baptized into that particular denomination. That's right. And there's no future baptism once the child has grown up and is able to make their own free will decision uh, for the Lord. They don't have that. So our position is unique. It's not like either one of those. Yes. But in this sermon, you explain the importance of that free will decision that each individual themselves has to make and seal by going into the waters of baptism. And then you discuss the proper position that the church and then the parents should have concerning infant and child baptism. That's right. So let's go right into the message. And then afterwards, we'll be back for a short discussion and then we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. Yes, yeah. And we invite you to have your bread and your cup ready for that special holy time. Yes. Okay. We're having a little tech <laughs> having a little so technical dreaded technical difficulties. <laughs> getting the movie up there. <laughs> oh dear. The gremlins are appearing. Are appearing. The, so the technical the gremlins, gremlins are appearing this morning. <laughs> so just be patient with us. Yes. By the yeah. way, happy it's well worth the uh, the wait because it's a wonderful sermon. Uh -huh. By the way, happy Valentine's Day. Oh, thank you very much, and the same to you. Yeah. yeah, we've been Valentine's with each other for a long 40, time. Forty, forty-six plus years. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's, well, that is a <laughs> Do I look the same? <laughs> to oh. me, you do. <laughs> We're set. Uh, we just got the signal from Mr. Producer. We're all set. So here is the baptism of little James Declan. Amen. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We will see that this is an important scripture to what we're studying today. Uh, today, we'll be celebrating the baptism of little James Declan Orris. Uh, and if you were here for the baptism of his brother Christopher early in 2018, you'll recognize that scripture up on the PowerPoint from back then. In this church, we believe it's important to know why we do what we do. Baptism is not just a traditional ceremony where a child is named. 
nor is it a relic included in the celebration of a new child that gives a nod to the rituals of the past. For the true believer in Jesus, baptism is a real and holy experience, a sacred time of heavenly significance. And whenever we have a baptism, whether infant or adult, we use it as an opportunity to make God's people aware of what the Bible teaches us on this crucial subject. So baptism will again be the focus of this sermon. Um, the Greek verb translated in the New Testament to baptize is the Greek word, and we know the New Testament's written in Greek, right? Old Testament Hebrew, New Testament Greek, is the Greek word baptizo, baptizo. It means to immerse, to submerge, to wash, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to make clean with water, to dip in or dip under, to sink, to bathe. And it came to be specifically identified with the Christian ordinance of baptism. Baptism from the Greek noun baptisma, meaning immersion, submersion, and emergence. There was certainly ceremonial washing in the Old Testament, both for ritual purity at the tabernacle and then the temple, and for hygienic purposes. However, through the prophets, God then applied the symbol of washing to what is needed for the condition of a person's life and the state of the heart. Isaiah the prophet declared the word of the Lord in Isaiah 1.16. He said, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, God says. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Jeremiah the prophet warned the people of Judah who would soon see their capital and temple destroyed as God allowed them to be taken into captivity to Babylon because of their continual sin. He warned them saying, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? As you enter the New Testament, baptism is introduced, not surprisingly, with the account of John the Baptist. I'll start by reading from Luke chapter 3, verse 2. In verse 1, we're told that this occurred in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for remission of sins. Repentance. The word may bring to mind many different things, but the Greek word means a change of direction, to turn around, and so to change one's mind and purpose, to think differently and for the better. The person is going one way, living according to their desires and wants, depending upon themselves and their notions, with no concern for God or the things of God or the will of God in their lives. But when they repent, they, they understand that the former way was wrong, and they turn away from sin, turn away from disobedience, and turn back to the God who created them. A turning from sin and a turning to God. So John preached a baptism of repentance for, for the remission of sins. Remission, the Greek word so translated means forgiveness, freedom and pardon, release from bondage, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of our sins, a pardon of our sins, setting us free and releasing us from the bondage and guilt and penalty of our sins. Repentance is the first necessary step to forgiveness, and the waters of baptism were a statement of such, the desire to have our hearts, our lives washed clean. The Apostle Matthew gives the account this way. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching 
in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is at hand. And the people went out and confessed their sins and were baptized by him in the Jordan. But note the designation of John as the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Repentance is the first necessary step for forgiveness, but it is not enough. It's not sufficient. It simply prepares the way for the Lord. The Lord is needed if forgiveness is to be true and complete, and the change of direction in our lives is sure and permanent. We are, in a sense, in a wilderness, wandering in this world, too often lost and confused, and we're bound up in the things of this world, not doing what we know deep down we should do. When we wake up and we understand that we need to turn to God, how can all that has gone before truly be forgiven? And how can we, people of clay, be truly reconciled, brought into fellowship, friendship, with a creator God who is all holy and good and pure? How can all the sins of the past be wiped out and we be washed clean so that we can know him and have the hope of being able to stand before him? And once we know the right way, how can we ever hope to walk in that right way day in and day out? We have the desire, but where does salvation come from? And the answer John gave was the Lord. Prepare the way for the Lord. A few verses down, we read John's testimony. He says in Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And we read in the Gospel of the Apostle John, the next day John, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then John said, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament, many lambs were sacrificed. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the Passover account, how the Israelites were set free from slavery in Egypt, that in the last plague on the Egyptians, God had the Israelites put the blood of a sacrificed lamb on the lintel and the two doorposts of each house so that the punishment about to be inflicted on Egypt would pass over them. They were safe under the blood of the lamb. And the Passovers that followed, at least while there was still a temple, celebrated with the sacrifice of a Paschal lamb and the Passover supper. And often with the different old covenant sacrifices, such as the peace offering and the sin offering, hands were laid on the animal intended for sacrifice. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest would sacrifice one young goat and lay both hands on the second, confessing over it the iniquities and, tra and the transgressions of the people before driving it into the wilderness. It was a statement that the sins of the people and the priests were now being transferred to this little innocent animal who was perfect, without spot, without blemish, who had done nothing wrong, yet was acting as a substitute, bearing the penalty in their place for their sins and their wrongdoings. 
And when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was the Holy One, the only perfect, sinless one in all of human history. One who was tempted in every way as we are, yet from conception to horrendous death on the cross was without sin, never sinned. And with the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, baptism took on its greatest and most complete meaning. After his resurrection, the Lord Jesus gave a commission to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And after the ascension on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples, the Apostle Peter gave a powerful sermon, proving to those of Israel listening that Jesus, who was crucified and now risen in fulfillment of the Hebrew Scriptures, is indeed both Lord and Christ, Messiah. And then you read, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the Apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Again, repent. But notice, he says, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, for the forgiveness of sins. They were to be immersed in, saturated with the name of Jesus Christ. For now the means had been made by which their sins could truly be forgiven. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Revelation 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Remember how when the soldiers checked to make sure that Jesus was dead on the cross, they pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. The sinless blood of the Son of God that would wash men and women clean. The apostle wrote, 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. All sin. All sin. There is nothing in our past that cannot be forgiven in the blood of Messiah if we turn and come to him. Paul said to the church at Corinth, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And then he gives a list of terrible sins, saying such will not inherit the kingdom of God. But he ends by saying in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The writer of Hebrews says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses our consciences from dead works to serve, to serve the living God. Peter says we were redeemed, purchased back to God from our aimless conduct with the precious blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1.18, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There is true forgiveness in Messiah. This is God's love extended to mankind. God's justice must deal with sin. 
God's love and mercy desires each person forgiven and set free. And on the cross, the holiness of God in Christ Jesus accomplishes both. We just need to receive it. But the symbolism of baptism speaks of even more that is available to the believer in Jesus. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. And Paul goes on to give the teaching that when we come to Jesus, the old man, the old person is crucified. And you notice the symbolism of baptism. The old sinful self is dead and buried even as we go into the water. And then we come up out of the water even as Christ rose from the dead in the resurrection power of the Lord as a new creature, a new person in Christ. With the life of Jesus now reigning inside of us, he says that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves in bondage to sin. We are no longer in this all alone, but Christ lives in us, his eternal life changing us to be the people God has called us to be. And friends, this is good news. This is the gospel. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, the apostle speaks of the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He proclaims in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Brand new. Brand new and set free and the resurrection life of Messiah. And who is this baptism for? There is an account in the book of Acts where Philip the evangelist, directed by the Spirit of God, witnesses to the Ethiopian eunuch who was returning home from Jerusalem on a desert road in Gaza. And the man is reading the remarkable prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, about one who would be led as a sheep to the slaughter. But the Ethiopian is having difficulty understanding the prophecy. So Philip, it says, opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture began to preach Jesus to him. And as they went down the road and they came to some water, the Ethiopian asked, what hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. If you believe with all your heart, you may. The New Testament shouts that we are saved through faith, Ephesians 2.8, Romans 3.21 and forward, and so many other scriptures really only saved people, people who believe in Jesus, go into the water of baptism with sincerity. You can take an unbeliever and dunk him or her over and over. It's not going to do any good, right? But baptism serves as a moment in time which seals the faith, makes firm the salvation, and announces the confession that is asked of all true believers. Too often as the Israelites in the time of Elijah, people will falter between two opinions. But when we have settled in our hearts that Jesus is the Son of God, and we make a stand going into that water, reckoning our old man dead, and counting totally upon Jesus, making him our Lord, and wanting all he has for us in his Holy Spirit, it is a powerful declaration which magnifies our relationship with the Lord and opens and closes doors 
in spiritual realms. Baptism is a real experience. Jesus said, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father, who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father, who is in heaven. In Luke chapter 12, he says, he will confess us before the angels of God. When a person is baptized into Jesus Christ, they are declaring in the sight of Almighty God to the church, to the whole world, believer and unbeliever, to holy angels, as well as to Satan and his demons, this one belongs to Jesus Christ. This one is in the family of God. This one is sealed and kept safe, shielded in the blood of Jesus, and every demon must flee from them in Jesus' name. They are set-apart ones, holy ones, set apart for God's anointing. And not only that, but it's a moment the Christian remembers and holds on to, receives strength from for the rest of his or her life in this world. So what about infants, the little ones, the young ones, who do not have the reasoning power to make the decision for Christ? Certainly we would like them sealed as well in this declaration of the grace of Almighty God. And it seems from earliest times, according to extra-biblical sources, that Christians baptize their infants. In the New Testament, you read in several places that the whole household was baptized. Lydia of Philippi, she and her household were baptized, Acts chapter 16. The Philippian jailer to whom Paul and Silas said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And it says immediately he and all his family were baptized, Acts chapter 16. Paul says he baptized the household of Stephanus, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And then you have Cornelius' household salvation in Acts chapter 10, 47, and related in, in chapter 11, verse 14. And it would be natural, it would be natural that there would be some children in these households. Remember Acts 2:38. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. The mention of children in that scripture could be speaking about time-wise, down the road in time, or about their children right now, or both. Certainly, Jesus encouraged the children to be brought unto him. Luke chapter 18, verse 15. Then they also brought infants to him, infants, that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children Come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Matthew chapter 18, and Jesus called the little child to him, set him in their midst, the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. The infants and the little children are innocent and humble and dependent upon their parents, unlike the prideful disciples who were arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And little children naturally gravitate to Jesus because their hearts are still soft. Their consciences are still alive. They have a sin nature, we know that, right? But there is as yet no intentional attitude of sin and rebellion with knowledge as there most certainly will be in their future. 
We all know what happens without the Lord. As the person grows up and becomes cynical, prideful, dark, the heart hardens and the conscience becomes seared. But for right now, Jesus says of these little ones, of such is the kingdom of God. How then can we mitigate and combat that future wandering and human inclination? Remember our opening scripture, Proverb 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Probably the best argument for baptizing infants and little children comes from that aspect of baptism that speaks of introduction into the community of believers an introduction into the covenant of God. In the Old Testament, God made a covenant with the physical descendants of Abraham according to the flesh. And on the eighth day after birth, the male children were circumcised and the name was given to the boy. The circumcision was an outward sign of God's covenant with his people and initiation into the Jewish community. But in Jesus, we now have a new covenant in his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And it is a covenant for all those who have faith like Abraham, his spiritual children from every nation and tribe and language, both circumcised Jews, uncircumcised Gentiles, both male and female. And the proper Christian ordinance for reception into this new covenant and the family of God is baptism. In this sense, baptism is the New Testament equivalent to circumcision, the new spiritual circumcision, so to speak. As Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, in him, in Christ, you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And the children of believers in Jesus certainly have a special place, a chosen position. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is dealing with Christians who have unbelieving spouses. And he tells them in verse 12 and 13 that if the spouse is willing to live with them, then they should not divorce that spouse. And he gives the reason in verse 14. He says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean but now they are holy. The faith of the believing spouse sanctifies, consecrates, sets apart his or her whole family, and even one, just one believing parent places their children in a special standing with God, but now they are holy. Hagios in the Greek, meaning sacred, holy, consecrated set apart to be made holy, to be made pure, to be made saints. Christian, because of your faith, God has his hand upon the lives of your little ones. He has his hedge of protection around them. He will not leave them alone. Even when they go far astray and it looks hopeless, he will call them back. And your teaching and training of them in the Lord and in his scriptures is a critical part of that. And baptism declares this new covenant promise for these infants and little children to all the world, to both the church and the unbeliever, to both holy angels and the demons that seek to destroy them. We believe the water symbolizes and proclaims as a covering the blood of Jesus, a powerful shield as a child goes through his or her life. So how do we reconcile baptism, which is a free will acceptance in faith and knowledge, with baptism as an introduction into the church 
and God's covenant. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That word for train up in the Greek means to dedicate, to discipline, to inaugurate, to train or train up to narrow, as to put on the narrow path. If a little child or baby is soiled, what must the parent do? Wash them, right? And as that baby grows, what does the parent do when they get dirty and grimy? Teach them to wash themselves. But what must a grown child do at some point? Take the responsibility of washing themselves. So in our church, we baptize the baby and make the declaration that this child belongs to Jesus by baptizing the child into the faith of the parents. It is the parents' confession in knowledge and the parents' commitment to raise up, train up, immerse this child in the knowledge of the Lord that actuates the baptism and opens the door for the special work of God's Holy Spirit in the child's life. We believe this makes access for the kingdom power and the kingdom anointing to come upon the child and seals the child for that special future day. For then in hope, we believe and trust the Lord that someday, that special future day, he himself, of his own knowledge and free will, will go into the waters of baptism, now with a like faith in Jesus Christ. Both baptisms, infant and adult, part of the one baptism in the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless this baptism with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that for all who have heard this message, the words in the book of the prophet Jeremiah would ring in our ears and resound in our hearts. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. That was a great sermon. That was really a great sermon. And you, you really explained in wonderful depth the, uh, the meaning of the scriptures given to us on baptism. And you just, you know, you went through all the points so, so well and so clearly. It was, that you. was really good. Thank you. And to better give our viewers uh, an understanding of the baptism we conducted back on that day in 2019 for little James, I want to read the questions I asked our daughter and her husband, as well as the words that we use in the baptism. Yeah. Um, and as you do, uh, Mr. Producer is going to put up photos taken that day. And remember, this is from 2019, uh, before COVID hit. So you're not going to see any masks or social distancing because, you know, life was normal. <laughs> right. So uh, these are the questions I asked. Patty and Billy, do you believe in Jesus with all your hearts? Do you promise to bring this child up in the knowledge and salvation of the Lord? Do you commit yourselves to teaching him God's word, the Bible, saturating his life in the love and grace, the righteousness and holiness that is only in Jesus Christ our Lord, and praying always for the anointing of God's Holy Spirit upon him? And they answered, obviously, yes to those questions. And then I said, then come and let James Declan Oris be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then the actual baptism, I said, James Declan, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you be brought to the Father through the Son in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, one God, Forever be praised. Amen. 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 And then we had a wonderful prayer and blessing over their entire family. 
and it was a beautiful day and we and, and afterwards then we had such a wonderful luncheon um, and it was catered by What's Cooking in Madison and they're really good. They had the most delicious food, so it was wonderful. And like all proud grandparents, um, I wanted to show you what our two young grandsons look like. This was taken this past uh, Christmas and there is Christopher in the back, uh, you know, in the in the back and J James. little James is in the front. front. Praise so. the Lord. <laughs> okay, so let, let's now celebrate the Lord's Supper and thank him for this great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Father, consecrate this time, we pray. Yes, Lord. Those watching who join with us now, Father, make this a sacred time for them as well. The presence of your Holy Spirit in these rooms. Yes. Father God, as we have this communion with you as a fellowship, Father, to remember that perfect sacrifice made for us on the cross. Yes. As we take this bread and proclaim the body of Jesus, Heavenly Father, heal your people, we pray. Yes. Lord. That by the stripes of Jesus, we are indeed healed, healed in our spirit healed in our soul, our mind, healed in our body. Give your people strength this morning, supernatural strength, in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we take this cup and proclaim the blood of Jesus, the blood of the new covenant, the sinless blood that washes us clean, Father God, be merciful, be uh, uh, kind and loving kindness to your people, Father God, yes, to forgive Lord. us. Forgive us, heal us spiritually, wash us clean, Father, and do the work in our lives, Father God, to change us, make us the people we should be, in Jesus' name. And we thank you and praise you in that precious yes, name, Father. Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let us proclaim together the body of Jesus. The body of, of Jesus. Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you for your wholeness, Lord. Yes, Father. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And let Thank us proclaim Jesus, together. Holy yes, Lord. And let us proclaim together the blood of Jesus. The blood, blood of, of Jesus. Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Heal the prayer request, Lord. Yes. Hear the prayer requests of your people. And yes, we, as we pray to you through the temple of our Lord Jesus Christ, oh, Father, hear from heaven. Hear those prayer requests right now, Lord. Yes, Lord. And you may be watching this uh, communion um, later on, not at the live time, not during the live stream. You uh, may have come 24-7 later to watch it. But there is no time element with the Lord. He is above time. And he yes, hears your Lord. prayers right now. Yes. And he's doing a work right now in your lives. He's making you whole, spirit, soul, and body in Jesus' name. Amen. Shielding you with the blood of Jesus. That every demon must flee. That your situation be set aright. And Father, we yes, ask this in the powerful name of your son, Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. And amen, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. If you've been blessed amen. by these live streams, please tell others about them. Yes. And we post them up, as I said, for viewing as soon as possible yeah. after we sign off. It would be great um, if you would subscribe to the channel. Yes. Give us a thumbs up yeah. as you find them helping you in your walk with the Lord. We put up the yes. post office box um, and the email address, so we would love to hear your comments for you to write to us. And I yeah, just want very to much appreciate it. wish you again yeah. a, a very blessed you. Valentine's Day. And thank you. Have, you. And, and, you the, and same to you. Thank you. You have a little gift here from your what two grandsons. That? Oh, how cute. He says, Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, that's, that's Christopher's hands. Right. Oh, and how cute. They said, Dear my mayor, we oh. love you. Lots of love, Christopher and James. Oh, how cute. So little, little 
Oh, gosh. Oh, I love that. I think our daughter, Patty, was also helping in this. <laughs> they were a little, she was a little involved in that, yeah. right? Oh, all my favorite flowers and hearts and, and jewelry. Hearts and, and little teacups. And like the teacup like. and all. Oh, that is so cute. Isn't that nice? Oh, gosh, I'm going to treasure that always. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank Please you. join us next Sunday morning at 1030 for the Shia Jeshub Christian, Christian Tabernacle channel live stream. Father, anoint the blessing now, I pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Complete wholeness and peace, spirit, soul, and body. In Yeshua HaMashiach's name, Jesus the Messiah. Amen and amen. Amen. And have a wonderful, blessed week as you love and serve the Lord. Amen. amen.